welcome back, A Push Crew. Today we're taking a look at the Roaring Twenties. If you're studying the periods 1919 to around 1929 in your A Push class or using any of these textbooks, this video is going to help you get a five on that A Push exam. And important to keep in mind is even before the Roaring Twenties, there was a fear following World War I. It actually begins during the war, if you recall, in 1917, the Communist Party came to power in Russia. This is the Bolshevik Revolution, and many Americans were concerned that perhaps this was the start of a communist movement all over the globe. Strikes actually occur also in 1919. This is a completely separate issue, even though some people blame these strikes on radical movements. Most of them were about increasing workers' wages, reducing hours, and improving safety conditions. But you get strikes going down in many important industries. You have this great steel strike in 1919, the Boston police strike where police officers actually go on strike. And one of the important outcomes of these strikes is very often the National Guard was called out to break up these strikes and public opinion throughout the 1920s is going to be very anti-union. Race riots also occur following and in fact during the war. This was a result of American cities changing demographically. There was a lot of resentment over competition for jobs between white and black residents and over housing. In fact, some of the worst racial rioting takes place in 1919 in Chicago where over 40 people are killed during the riots. And then you have bombs go off in 1919-1920 in eight American cities. And many people in the country think that this is the start of a radical movement, a revolution going to take place in America. And this becomes known as the Red Scare. And it's important to keep in mind that these events you see, these four things are not necessarily connected, but when all of them are happening around the same time, you have the bombings, you have this Red Scare developing. And the guy who's going to play a key role during this is the Attorney General of the United States, A. Mitchell Palmer. And he's going to lead a series of raids of suspected radicals in the United States and thousands of people are going to be arrested during these Palmer raids during the first Red Scare. Another thing that kind of continues going into the 1920s is once again a rise of nativism. You know the Palmer raids led to the mass arrest of socialist, anarchist, union organizers, or other suspected radicals and very often these people, these individuals were being arrested for their ideas and in many cases, there was very little evidence, if any, because these people were just guilty of believing in things that were unpopular during the decade. And with this Red Scare, there is going to be a continued hatred towards new immigrants in the 1920s. In fact, in 1921, the Quota Act will be passed, uh, signed into law by President Harding, and it's going to limit immigration numbers to 3% of those living in the U.S. as of 1910. Add another law to immigration policy called the National Quota Act of 1924. This one sets the quota at 2% of the immigrants in the U.S. and they use the year 1890 and they use the numbers of the 1890 census. And the reason why they switch that year to 1890 is they're trying to limit the new immigrants that were largely coming in from southern and eastern Europe. These immigrants were considered undesirable and they want to cut off that immigration from those countries in particular. And 1890 is kind of the year where there were less of those immigrants than in years following. The Quota Act of 1924 is also going to severely restrict Asian immigrants. In fact, no Japanese immigrants are allowed to come at all. But it's important to keep in mind, during the 1920s, you're going to have an unrestricted immigration from the Western Hemisphere. So lots of immigrants coming in, especially from Mexico, working in jobs in the Southwest, predominantly in agriculture. And one of the most important cases and really symbolic of the anti-immigrant feeling of the 1920s is the case of Sacco and Vanzetti. And there they are, Sacco and Vanzetti. And what happens is these two men are Italian immigrants who were charged with robbery and murder in 1921, Boston. And they're found guilty and sentenced to death. And this trial really demonstrates the tensions of the era many people felt that Sacco and Vanzetti 
were not receiving justice. And what occurs, and the reasons why they say this, is very often during the case, it's the fact that they're Italian immigrants, they're radicals, they're anarchists, and they're World War I draft dodgers. Those become the issues in the case. And ultimately, both men will be executed in 1927, in spite of the fact that there's a lot of people around the world calling for their release. Another thing about the 1920s that occurs kind of connected to the issue of immigration and anti-radical feelings is the resurgence of the KKK. If you recall, the KKK is created following the Civil War during Reconstruction, and in the 20s, the Klan broadens its influence throughout the decade. They expand their influence not just in the South, but also in the Midwest and in other regions of the country. And their hatred isn't confined to African-American people exclusively any longer. They are going to speak out and be against not only African-Americans, but immigrants, especially those Southern and Eastern European immigrants, Catholics, radicals, and any other people that were not white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant. In fact, just before the 1920s, a popular film, a very pro-KKK film, The Birth of a Nation, it's extremely popular in the United States, um, and in the film, it is the Klan that are the heroes of Reconstruction. They're going to organize themselves throughout the decade. They're going to become very powerful, up to 5 million members by 1925. And what they are saying to the American people is that they are a patriotic organization. They support uh, largely, and they're going to get support largely, white Protestants, especially in the small towns and cities. And the Klan itself will exert tremendous political influence. Here you see them marching in Washington, D.C. So far, this decade's been kind of a downer, but kind of why is it called the Roaring Twenties? Well, one of the things that happens is you have the rise, the development of the mass consumption economy. In 1920, it is the first time a majority of Americans live in urban areas. You could see that on the chart right there, 51%. And the economic prosperity as a whole, the economy is going to roar. There's a tremendous growth in the stock market, and very often this growth was built on people buying on margin. They're taking out loans to buy stock, and we're going to see how that turns out in the next video. And the reason they're doing this is they're investing based on speculation. They feel this market is going to continue to go up, and for much of the decade, it will go up until the Great Crash in 1929. The mass consumption economy is really going to be dependent upon a large number of new and affordable consumer goods becoming available. Things like the vacuum cleaner, the washing machine, and other goods are going to be purchased by people. And really, electricity in homes leads to this increased demand for consumer appliances. Once people are moving to cities and electricity is available in more and more homes, you can now have these new consumer goods. And these are going to save time in doing things like housework. Fueling this consumerism was buying goods on credit. The installment plan is really kind of introduced on a wide scale in the 20s. And the idea is you can possess today and pay tomorrow. So of course now lots of people are able to buy things that they normally could not. The downside of this of course is debt. And we're going to see once again the consequences of this debt in our next video. And advertising is going to play a key role in the 1920s. You see one of the popular ads in the 20s right there. Bad breath, halitosis makes you unpopular. So brush your teeth, children. An advertising industry is going to manipulate consumer demand by increasing people's desire to have various products. Another area that's going to really transform itself in the 1920s is transportation. Frederick Taylor's Principles of Scientific Management. And his whole idea was that workers can improve their productivity, that management can improve the productivity of workers by having them eliminate certain motions in the production process. And the guy who really kind of adopts many of these ideas is Henry Ford. Cars become affordable for the average American, the famous Model T you could see there. And really, the assembly line introduced by Henry Ford allows for this mass production to take place in the automobile industry. Now, while the railroad industry is going to be hurt by cars, there is going to be a huge boom in other industries such as steel and rubber and gasoline, highway instruction, and a whole host of others because of the rise 
of the automobile and not just economic impacts of the car but also the car becomes a badge of freedom and equality and it's going to have social consequences as well. The airplane plays a key role in fact one of the key kind of figures in this story is Charles Lindbergh who becomes the first person to fly solo across the Atlantic. He goes from New York to Paris in a very long journey of over 33 hours in a single engine plane. Some scary stuff. And when he comes back, he becomes a national hero, an instant celebrity because people are able to follow his journey with the radio. And that leads us to the mass media and the impact of mass media on the 20s. It's really important to understand the impact of the radio. In November of 1920, we have the first radio broadcast out of Pittsburgh. It announces the election of Warren G. Harding uh, to the American public. And really, the radio is going to play a key role in tying the nation together. It provides shared experiences. People are listening to the same advertisements, the same speeches, the same forms of entertainment on a national scale. You also see in the 1920s the rise of the movie industry, and especially in Hollywood. Um, out in Los Angeles, there is the famous Hollywood sign as it looked back in the day. Innovations in the movie industry itself. You have the jazz singer in 1927. It becomes the first talkie. And a part of this rise of mass media like radio and movies is the celebrity culture of the 1920s. You have people that become national celebrities, people such as Babe Ruth, the famous New York Yankee, and the radio and the movie, once again, fuels the consumption economy that characterizes the 1920s. Gender in the 1920s is another important thing. This image of the decade was a decade of social customs being challenged, not just from women, but for all different groups. And it was young women in cities that were really challenging the social customs of America. Jazz music, dancing, drinking bootleg liquor, and other challenges to traditional values. Do have, for example, labor-saving devices, such as the vacuum cleaner, the washing machine changing the roles of homemakers for some women. If you were a woman who were a, was able to afford these new appliances, you now had more free time. And the ultimate symbol of this kind of youthful rebellion of young women was, of course, the flappers. You have some women who go much further with their challenging of existing social customs of the decade. And one of those women is Margaret Sanger, who spoke openly in spite of protests and in spite of her being arrested for obscenity laws in the support of birth control and demanding that women should have the right to have access to birth control. These changes in the 1920s lead to a growth of fundamentalism and eventually you're going to see the Scopes Monkey Trial. So as the decade is seeing a battle between the values of the modernizing cities and the traditional values of rural areas, you're going to see the growth of a fundamentalist movement. And fundamentalists believe that every word in the Bible should be considered literally true. And the radio allows for preachers such as Billy Sunday to reach a mass audience, and he did so in the 20s when he spoke out against things like drinking and dancing, jazz music and gambling, and other things that some fundamentalists opposed. And the big moment happens when the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, sought to challenge a law in Tennessee, the Butler Act, that outlawed the teaching of evolution in public schools. And they find a teacher, John Scopes, who will violate the law. And in 1925, he is arrested for teaching evolution in a school in Dayton, Tennessee. The entire world follows the trial by listening on the radio, the famous Scopes monkey trial, because it dealt with evolution. You have two of the best lawyers in the country. The prosecutor is a religious fundamentalist, also former presidential candidate William Jennings Bryan, and the defense attorney is Clarence Darrow, probably the most famous defense attorney in this time period. The trial goes on and Scopes is convicted. He gets off on a technicality, and really the trial, the Scopes trial, demonstrated the tensions between the modern and the traditional religious values of the 1920s. Prohibition is a key part of the 1920s. If you recall, the 18th Amendment was ratified in 1919, and it prohibited the manufacture and sale of alcoholic beverages. And the Volstead Act is passed, which was the federal law that would enforce the 18th Amendment. 
The issue of prohibition was very controversial. There was fierce opposition, especially in large cities, especially amongst immigrant communities, to the banning of alcohol. Bootleg liquor was served at speakeasies and legal clubs where alcohol was sold. People were making their own alcohol, and in many cases, they were completely ignoring the law. Part of the problem was there was understaffed law enforcement. There wasn't enough police to police the borders of the United States to get all the different areas where alcohol was being distributed and made. And the other issue you can see in the political cartoon was widespread corruption. Very often police, politicians, and judges were paid off to look the other way. And as a result of prohibition, you get the rise of organized crime. The big, the big guy, the famous guy is, of course, Al Capone in Chicago. You have events like the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, where violence increases. In spite of all this kind of controversy, drinking does go down in the 1920s, but ultimately, prohibition will be seen as a noble experiment that will fail, and eventually it will be overturned with the 21st Amendment in the early 1930s. And the big problem is, you can make something like alcohol illegal, but many people still want it. And so they're going to ignore the law. Great photo, people marching, not for civil rights, not for freedom, but for beer. The decade of the 1920s for African Americans was a mixed decade. Lynchings continued to be a problem. The KKK was becoming more and more popular. Jim Crow laws, Plessy versus Ferguson, all of that stuff remained a fact of life. And while those challenges are important, African Americans continued to find ways to resist this injustice. Recall there was a great migration all the way before World War I where you have this mass movement of African Americans into northern cities and you have the spread of jazz music out of New Orleans into cities such as New York and Chicago. Harlem becomes kind of the unofficial cultural center of black America and during the 20s you have a famous event known as the Harlem Renaissance. You have writers such as Claude McKay, Langston Hughes, Zora Neale Hurston, famous jazz musicians like Louis Armstrong and really an important idea of the Harlem Renaissance is this idea of the new Negro. In fact there was this emphasis on black pride, racial pride and celebrating the cultural traditions of that black community in much of the Harlem Renaissance's work. And outside of the Harlem Renaissance, you have a guy by the name of Marcus Garvey. He is a immigrant from Jamaica, which was a British colony. He comes to the United States and he creates the Universal Negro Improvement Association, the UNIA. He's gonna call for African Americans to go back to Africa. He believed in separatism. He felt that African Americans would not be able to get justice and equality in America. But beyond that, Garvey's movement is going to promote black pride, black owned business, self confidence, self reliance, self sufficiency in the African American community. And he's going to play a key role in mobilizing ordinary African Americans who were perhaps not touched by the writings of the Harlem Renaissance. They're going to be touched by the words of Garvey. And finally, make sure you know about the Lost Generation. This is a group of writers like F. Scott Fitzgerald, Ernest Hemingway, Sinclair Lewis, and their writing is going to criticize different aspects of the decade. They're going to question the reasons for fighting World War I, small town values in places like Dayton, Tennessee, fundamentalist religious views, and the materialism of the 1920s. So this group of artists are disillusioned with the old ideals of the past as well as the new materialistic culture. That's going to close out the Roaring Twenties. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, click like on the video, tell your friends, and have a beautiful day. Peace.